You are listening to the podcast of the Maciasz Korvinas Collegium, the largest talent management institute in Hungary. If you want to know more about our mission, please look up our English website at mcc.hu slash en or check out our Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter channels. For interesting articles and analysis of our professors, external contributors, and students, look up our knowledge base at korvinak.hu slash en. Thank you for joining us, ladies and gentlemen. My name is John Wesley Reed, Senior Fellow with the Hungry Foundation and the Matthias Corvinus Collegium School of Law. Uh, with here with Alliance Defending Freedom attorney Logan Spina. Logan is uh, focusing a lot on um, academic freedom, so free speech within the collegiate atmosphere for students, for professors, and um, unfortunately, his job is needed. Um, we're glad he's employed, but it's one of those uh necessary necessary problems uh or necessary goods i don't know how to say it uh maybe we'll let, edit that part out but um you know we're we're thankful to have people like logan and his colleagues uh fighting for these freedoms that for some reason among the uh the bastions of free speech the bastions of free thought uh are seeing a lot of oppression um it's a sad irony so logan thanks so much for your time brother it's a privilege to do that work, and it's a privilege to be able to talk to you about it today. Now, Alliance Defending Freedom also has a international component, uh, Alliance Defending Freedom International, and uh, they're doing a lot of great work uh, in Europe and, and all over. Uh, folks, if you saw the uh, the hullabaloo, uh, what was it, a month and a half ago now? I, I can't keep the month straight, but this was in Brussels with uh, NatCon 2024. Uh, there, was some, there was some problems leading up to it. Um, reserving his spots. They kept getting canceled because of the alleged hate speech that comes from uh, NatCon. Um, if you're not familiar with NatCon, spo- spoiler alert, uh, there is no hate speech. But, uh, you know, that that was the uh, the narrative. And so they kept getting canceled. And then finally, there was a venue um, that is owned by someone who is not necessarily a conservative. And he even said, you know, we welcome speech. We welcome even ideas we disagree with. And then the the mayor of that particular section of um of Brussels shut him down or tried to shut him down uh but there are ADF attorneys uh boots on the ground there and uh literally burning the midnight oil and I think it was like 2 a.m uh when the, the I guess the equivalent the Supreme Court variant there uh ruled in free speech and then that even provoked the um um the prime minister <laughs> uh, Belgium to say free speech is welcome here even if we disagree so it was really fun to watch but anyways that's my that's my uh, way of saying props to ADF uh, domestically in the U.S., but also uh, abroad. You guys are doing great, great work. Um, yeah, thanks for that. I'm, I'm proud to stand with the, our members of the ADF international team and amazed with the work that they did in that situation. I definitely encourage your listeners to go look into that some more. It's an amazing story. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it really is. Um, actually, two podcasts ago, I had Rod Dreher on, and uh, Rod Dreher is one of the speakers there, and and he was there, like there in person, and he told me all about it, and it was a lot of fun. So, anyways, wow. great work. Well, um, speaking of free speech, uh, you know, one area that, or my focus here as a senior fellow with the Hunger Foundation uh, is free speech. That that's that's been my thing. That's what I did for several years in D.C. as a journalist, uh, covering a lot of uh, Supreme Court cases. Uh, I mean, including ADF's three hundred three Creative, Masterpiece Cake Shop, Nifla versus Becerra. Um, and so that's just, that's why I was assigned free speech out here. Um, but one of my jobs is to focus on writing, but also interviewing the experts on niche topics within my focus. So one topic among free speech that is not talked about too much is speech versus conduct. Now, for those listening, while you might not know the, uh, I guess, the soft title of speech versus conduct, I am positive that you have seen some sort of battles where that has been the core, where somebody, a typical example, I should say, is where somebody will say, hey, I was just, you know, expressing my opinion. I was just, you know, free speech, whatever. And I was arrested. And while it's true that they were expressing themselves and the what they were saying was not necessarily a violation, it, 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 it was protected speech. What they were doing while they were doing that expression was not legal. And Logan, I will let you take it from here. Speech versus conduct. It it is a great topic. And as you pointed out, it's sort of remarkable how little it's discussed when it really is 
the first question in any free speech case, right? Was there speech at all or was this just conduct? And then and then there are additional nuances we can get into when it comes to this distinction between um when it comes to the distinction between expressive conduct and other things like that. But but the first question is always going to be, you know, that that basic distinction bes- between speech and conduct. And I think it's most obvious when we're talking about sort of these recent uh, disputes on college campuses related to the war going on in Israel and Palestine. So you you see people there claiming, for example, that occupying a building, taking it over, or setting up a tent city on in the middle of the quad where you're trespassing, or assaulting other students, or tearing down their expression by tearing down the posters related to hostages or things like that. The claim there is that that's somehow expressive or speech when it really is just law-breaking activity, you're trespassing, you're attacking other people, you're tearing down other people's expression. And so the basic point there is the First Amendment simply doesn't protect that. Now, as you pointed out, there can be times when conduct is also speech. An obvious example is something like sign language, but other things you know, that get a little closer uh, to, to something that's not sort of linguistic conduct, but it's still conduct designed to express there's still some protection there. So things like burning the flag, for example. But even then, if the government's regulation is directed at the conduct, you can't complain if your conduct violates that kind of a law. And so to sort of explain that distinction, it goes back to a case called Texas versus Johnson in 1989. And there, the law prohibited flag burning. And so it was de- it was deemed to sort of target that conduct because of the message that was being expressed there, as opposed to say, for example, a law that says you can't set a fire in the middle of our in the middle of our street, right? If you if you if they prosecute you because they have a law that says no fires in the street and you burn a flag there, there's no danger that the officials are targeting you because of your political message of burning the flag because they have a rule against burn, burning stuff in the street in general. But if their mis- if their law only targets people who burn the flag. Then all of a sudden, it's clear that there's some desire to express a particular political view that they don't like, sort of a view that's offensive to their sense of patriotism. And then there's some First Amendment protection there. So there is some protection for conduct, but it's never going to be when you're violating general rules that apply to everyone, like no trespassing, no assault, no vandalism. So that first question is always critical, and it's usually something that gets missed, especially in my work in college campuses. And yet, if universities were simply uniformly enforcing the rules that they're allowed to enforce, which include uh, conduct that violates their university standards or the law, many of the problems that we see on college campuses either wouldn't exist or would be a lot smaller. Fun fact, um, Texas versus Johnson, the actual... um... The actual the, the guy there, Gregory Johnson, in the in the uh, eighty nine case, uh, just a few years ago, went outside the White House and burned a flag and was uh, I don't know if he was arrested, but him and his crew were detained for that very purpose. Is like, look, we're not saying you can't burn a flag. We're saying you can't light light a dang fire <laughs> right in front of the White <laughs> House. You know? I was I was there. I was like, oh, this is this is kind of cool. I, I didn't I saw it happening. I didn't know though at the time that it was Gregory Johnson himself. I, I read about that later. I was like, oh, that's one. Yeah, you, you can imagine the guy thinking, hey, I won the Supreme Court case on this. So now I sort of have a license to burn the flag anywhere. Exactly. But it turns out that's not true. <laughs> it also shows that he probably wasn't paying attention to the the actual jurisprudence there. But it's all maybe, maybe so. Yeah. <laughs> um, so I, I want to ask a question. This is actually really cool. I wasn't planning on asking this, but you said sign language could be considered conduct. Did I hear that right? Well, so so the I was just sort of getting to the point that there is a range of expressive conduct. Um, and so, you know, so so sign language is not words coming out of one's mouth. It's it's not it, it may not be the the sort of thing you think of as the dictionary definition of speech, but it's it's linguistic conduct, right? I mean, it's it's very clearly what you think of as speech. It's just that you're using motions to express a message. And that's sort of very obvious. That's sort of the, so. If you think it's sort of the spectrum of how conduct can be deemed expressive, that's sort of obviously on the line of we're gonna we're gonna view that as speech. And yeah. then there's other things that are less obvious. And there's there's an there's a there's a a few different legal tests for for some, for expressive conduct too. But I think what matters, I think for listeners, is to understand when the conduct violates a rule 
that governs, when the rule governs conduct, and it doesn't care if it's expressive or not, like don't burn, don't burn anything as opposed to don't burn the flag, right? That's going to be a situation where the rule is going to be enforced. And even if you yourself in violating the rule had intended for your conduct to be expressive, sort of like, like graffiti, right? That's, that's obviously written speech, which is normally protected by the first amendment. But if you're writing on somebody else's property, that's vandalism and it's not going to be protected. Yeah. No, I totally, I totally get what you're saying. I, I, was just making sure that I didn't miss something. But yeah, no, it totally makes sense. Um, you, you said you brought up Texas versus Johnson. That That's one case that I did study uh, somewhat in depth uh, a few years back. And what I found to be so fascinating is that it really did expose uh, the tension between uh, maybe not so much uh, conduct and speech, at least, at least with the particular uh, context that I'm referring to here. Is, but it was more of the, um, should it be protected even though it is highly, highly offensive. And what I really found fascinating is that uh, this was not necessarily an ideologically split decision. It was mixed on both sides, just like it's been mixed. um, uh, I mean, the U.S. House of Representatives several times has tried to pass uh, flag burning laws. And uh, several of those times, the yeses and nos were also mixed. You know, these days, everything is, or a lot of things are uh, partisan lines. We see that. Yeah. Uh, but it was very mixed. And another thing that was really cool is that uh, we know when you consider the time of Texas versus Johnson, it was in the 80s. You know, Supreme Court justices are typically up there in age. Uh, and then when you consider the timeline of World War II, I think there were three, two or three, maybe four. But I think I think there was about three justices who were in the military during World War II. One of them, and I, I, I wish I would have. Had you told me you were going to bring up Texas versus Johnson, mm-hmm. I would have gotten some names out, but it's okay. Um, there was, uh, I, I think there were two field grade officers, one who was in favor of allowing uh, flag burning and one who was opposed to it. Um, and so even, you know, both of them had a great sense of patriotism, not just, you know, militarily speaking, but also, I mean, the, the, if you, I'm sure you know this, but for those listening, the tension in their opinions is so so heavy. Uh, I believe it was um, Kennedy, correct me if I'm wrong, Logan, but I, I want to say it was Justice Kennedy who took a, a moment to say, we don't usually do this, but we're going to express our personal opinions as well to say um, that while we, the majority, believe it should be protected speech, and I'm, I'm heavily paraphrasing, while we, the majority, believe that it should be protected speech, we do find it to be absolutely abhorrent. So it was really interesting to see um, how transparent they were. And it really exposed the tension in uh, the more gray areas of free speech. What are your, what are your thoughts there? It's, it's a really good point. And it actually, I think the same reason that the First Amendment has to Uh, extend to offensive speech is one of the reasons that we distinguish speech and conduct in the first place. So I'm going to try to tie kind of two different points together. So one is, so going back to, you know, to Texas versus Johnson, the sort of famous quote there is that there, if there is a bedrock principle underlying the first amendment, it is that the government may not prohibit the expression of ideas simply because society finds the idea itself offensive or disagreeable. So that's an important precept, but it's important to ask sort of, okay, why? And I think it goes back to a case called Whitney versus California from 1927. And there the court said, those who won our independence believed that the final end of the state was to make men free to develop their faculties and that in its government, the deliberative forces should prevail over the arbitrary. They valued liberty both as an end and as a means. Mm. I think that's true, and I think it even connects to something more fundamental, which is the Declaration of Independence all the way from 1776, where it says that, you know, all men are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, that to secure these rights, governments are instituted among men. Okay, so there's rights that are prior to the institution of government. Government exists to secure those rights. But the point that Whitney sort of adds to that is that the rights are both ends and and means. In other words, they they work inside the system of government to make our system of government possible, right? When it comes to speech, you need to have the right to persuade your fellow citizens and your elected representatives that maybe what the law is today is wrong and it should be something else. And that that's going to involve sometimes advocating for things that are unpopular. 
right? So in order for speech to play its role as a means inside the democratic or Republican system of government, it has to be protected. But at the same time, our system recognizes that to some degree, speech is an end in itself because it's something that we have to possess by virtue of who we are as created beings. And government's purpose in, is to preserve that, not to regulate it. And so that also means that the, the government's judgment about whether something is offensive can't on its own be enough to restrict it. When, he, when you cross the line into conduct there, the government has, has a much freer hand, right? But as long as you're expressing something, even something that's deeply offensive, or even something that's advocating that the, the, the legal order that as it exists today is morally wrong or should be changed, that's all got to be protected. And, and it's sort of, Texas versus Johnson was exactly right to say that that is a bedrock principle. It literally goes all the way back to the Declaration of Independence. Yeah. So, um, Let's talk about some of the exercises that they have used, that the, that the court has used to uh, distinguish the two. I know, what was it, uh, Shank versus the U.S. is the notorious, uh, you can't yell uh, fire in a crowded theater, and then and then that was sort of uh, uh, modified in, uh, what was it, Brand Brandenburg? Brandenburg versus yep. Ohio? Um, yeah, exactly. Can you, so uh, basically, as I recall, and maybe sharpen me here, as I recall, Shank and Brandenburg, they're not that different. Uh, Shank was saying, um, the sorry, the opinion in Shank said, uh, you can't yell, uh, fire in a crowded theater. And the intent there was to say, you cannot yell it knowing that there's not a fire, uh, because, uh, you know, the, the, the obvious, the obvious, uh, how they can obviously lead to, uh, trampling and, and danger towards others. And then if, as I recall, Brandenburg basically clarified that to make sure that it, it was clear that um, if there is a fire, you can yell fire, but you can't do it. So for, you can't just do it willy nilly. You can't do it just to say, "Hey, I have free speech." Right? Can you can you sharpen that a bit for me? Yeah, I can try. So it's it's interesting because it's a phrase that's brought up all the time in the discussion of free speech, and it it's it, it is a bit of a misnomer, and and partially because of it, you know, as you point out, going back to the Shank case, you know, the person there was not prosecuted for yelling fire in a crowded theater, false or otherwise, right? You're dealing with prosecutions, I think, for advocacy of communism. It's 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 either that or one of the. It might have been somebody who was trying to uh, interdict people from like signing up for the draft in World War One. There there are range of cases the in the late. Yeah. In the World War One era and then into the early 1920s, where people were being prosecuted for sort of hindering the World War One war effort, or subsequent to that, advocating for communism, and Shank was applying a standard called the clear and present danger standard, I believe. And so the idea was the government can prohibit speech if it presents a clear and present danger to to various ends that it has, and then sort of as an illustration, you get that phrase about yelling fire in a crowded theater. Brandenburg overrules Shank when it comes to the substantive legal standard that it applied, the clear and present danger standard. And Brandenburg says you can't prosecute somebody unless their speech is directed to inciting or producing imminent lawless actions. So you're trying to get people to break the law right now and likely to produce that action. So you're actually like somewhat likely to succeed. Those two elements are required in order to prosecute somebody. And those, so you, but the, since the legal standard in Shank wasn't really applying this fire in a crowded theater idea, even though the case is reversed, the phrase is sort of bandied about from time to time. Yeah. But it's, it's, it, it ultimately, I think, is one that's not very helpful because it, it sort of, as you point out, it, it relates a lot to is there a fire? Do you think there is? What, what are you doing? That there, that honestly, it would relate a lot more to tort law, right? If you're like falsely misrepresenting a fact that leads to someone getting trampled, it'd be a lot more like a tort question as opposed to can the government ban this expression outright? You see what I'm saying? So, yeah, so mean, the issue I... with the government's the government's regulation of speech, especially when it comes to political speech like advocacy of communism, or in the Brandenburg case, it was advocacy of racist violence, and the court held that the speech was protected. Right? The government cannot step in to prohibit the speech unless it meets that standard or unless it falls into a range of other well-recognized exceptions to free speech, like um, libel or obscenity or true threats. Yeah. I guess I always just assumed that <clears throat> when the phrase, you can't yell fire in a crowded theater, I, I just always assumed that it, the context there was you cannot say it 
if you did not, if there was no fire, like it, to me, it just made common sense that if there is a fire, yes, you can say it and you'll be fine, but whatever. I'm, I'm glad the courts make those final decisions and uh, not me. Um, <laughs> but moving on to a similar topic though, um, an, another test, and, and this is a free speech, religious, I mean, it's also, it's obviously very much um, included in religious liberty issues. Uh, and that is um, strict scrutiny. And uh, as as a tool for the for uh, for the court to say the government did overstep, did not overstep. Do they have a uh, a compelling interest? If they do have an interest, you know, how far can they go? Can you expand on that a little bit, Logan? Yeah, absolutely. So strict scrutiny is a legal standard that you you sort of mentioned some of the elements there. It's a two part test that asks first if the government if the government is pursuing a what's called a compelling government interest, and you've got a bunch of cases that define what that is. And then ask second if what they're doing is narrowly tailored to achieve that interest or sort of another way of looking at it is if there are other ways that the government could be achieving their interests that are less burdensome on the rights in question, then they're going to fail that standard. So it's got to be basically you can't be burdening any more speech than you really need to in order to achieve this really important thing. And this test is born out of sort of the fundamental recognition with our system that no rights are completely absolute. Right. It, it's not that you as an individual have any sort of rights that, you know, sort of trump everything the government might need to do in every conceivable situation. There needs to be some flexibility on a case by case basis to, to, to sort things out over time. Uh, that's just sort of a principle of prudence. It's also true that there are probably some cases where the government would never, ever, ever be able to meet that standard. So you could say effectively you have an absolute right. So, for example, freedom of thought. Right. If the government tried to tell you what to think. You could you could say on the one hand, no, I have an absolute right to freedom of thought. The court might agree with that, or it might simply say, we don't need to decide if you have an absolute right. We can just sit here right now and tell the government doesn't have any interest in controlling what you actually think. Right? It could go in either direction, but strict scrutiny is basically a standard that is applied when the government regulates fundamental rights like free speech or free exercise of religion, and then uh, especially in the area of speech, if its regulation is based on the content. Of speech. So if, if the regulation says, here's what you can and cannot say, versus, for example, here's when you can say it, like no, no, no loudspeakers at three in the morning, right? That's what's referred to as a time, place, and manner restriction, which will not be evaluated at strict scrutiny. But if it says no political speech at three in the afternoon, all of a sudden you've got a content based regulation, and the government's only going to be able to do that if it passes that high standard. In the speech context, it is very rare. That the government's able to do that because it's very rare that the government either has a compelling interest in controlling what people say, or when it does have some compelling interest there, it's almost never true that the government's action in, in restricting that is the narrowly tailored means of, of achieving that. So strict scrutiny is a very protective standard because we recognize you know, the importance of, of fundamental First Amendment freedoms. These are great thoughts. Logan, uh, really appreciate your time, man. My, my final question is more of an application. And, um, you know, we, we did see, as you mentioned, the, uh, the college campus, uh, protests slash riots over, uh, the Palestine Israel conflict. Um, and that's, that's raised a lot of questions for me about, you know, how can students, you know, in any issue, no matter what the issue is, abortion, free speech, whatever it is, um, how can they be most effective in getting their message across in a way that is, um, uh, that leads to change and, and that doesn't break the law. <laughs> So I think it, it requires a few different things. Um, it requires care in defining and expressing your own message and sort of strategy in choosing your means and knowing the the, the conduct regulations, which we've talked about here, sort of that, that do apply on your campus. So talking about strategy in terms of selecting and expressing your message, I think you should understand, like, we live in a time of cancel culture, right? This is a real thing, unfortunately. And it's a cancel culture is not just sort of harsh reactions to speech, because that's something that's happened throughout history. And sometimes it's even warranted, right? Every community, every relationship has standards that they enforce. And sometimes speech will transgress those standards. So the idea that there's some consequence for speech, that's not exactly what cancel culture is. But what cancel culture is and what, what makes it special and what's going on in our society today is that it is a direct attempt to sort of redefine what another person is saying 
in order to impugn bad motives to them so that you can get to that consequence imposing part of the of the story without actually dealing with what they said right that's why you have a tendency of people you know trying to define sort of all criticism of one side or the other in this israeli palestine conflict for example as being either racist or supporting genocide or whatever and often what you don't see is direct engagement with the with what the actual person said instead you try to impugn their motives right and this happens in pretty much every hot button issue debate in our society today whether it's religion whether it's political debates whether it's debates uh, over other social policy so you need to understand as an as a speaker that's what people are going to try to do and so you need to craft your message in a way that makes that difficult so that when people try to do it to you it's obvious what they're doing and and their efforts fail and so i think people need to be strategic when it comes to defining what their message, they need to understand the social environment that they're speaking in. And the second one is, as so in particular with these college campus issues, be, be, be smart when it comes to understanding the way your college regulates conduct. And so you can protect yourself either if, if, the, if somebody else comes to try to disrupt your speech, to disrupt your event, you can be in a position to make sure that the, the university either protects you then then and there or that you're able to hold them accountable like for example contacting us at adflegal.org to file a lawsuit on your behalf right or if if it just in general be, you should be able to uh just understand what you can expect from your university or from other students and and be able to proceed from there in the event that you, you face barriers so i think those are two things to practically think about in order to sort of effectively speak in the campus environment today Logan Spina from Alliance Defending Freedom, thanks so much for your time, and I uh, look forward to talking with you or you know, some of your attorneys here again in the future. Thanks very much. See ya. Thank you for listening to this MCC podcast episode. For further media content, please look up our English website at mcc.hu slash en, or look for us on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. If you want to read more by our professors, external contributors, and students, check out our knowledge base at corvinac.hu en.